This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 760, recorded on May 26th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 20 degrees Celsius, 65 Fahrenheit, and overcast. Also joining me from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Howdy. 79 degrees, mostly sunny. It's all good. Here it's 24C and partly cloudy. We are really lucky to have three guests today. Uh, they have all been on TWIV before, so you'll recognize them, but they are all members of the WHO team investigating the origins of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and right up front from EcoHealth Alliance, Peter Daschak. Welcome back, Peter. Great to be here. From Noor Jelens Hospital in Denmark, Thea Colson fisher Welcome back. Thank you very much. And 12th degree overcast here in Copenhagen or Hillerød. And from Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, Marion Kopmans. Welcome back. Yeah. Hi there. Hi. And, and nice to be here. And uh, yes, we share the same weather, Tia. <laughs> <laughs> You're not too far apart, right? No. Nope. Yeah. Now, your hospital, Tia, is on, uh, in Copenhagen or outside of Copenhagen? A little north of Copenhagen. A little north, yeah. I was looking at the map before. I couldn't quite tell. Did I get the pronunciation right? Norgellens? Uh, Norgellens. Wow, I totally got it wrong. <laughs> but that's, uh, I learned today, I got, I was pronouncing Marion's name wrong all these years. No, now Copemans. I'll just remember Copods. How's that? Fine. I will, I will listen. I will look up at least. All right. So let's t let's talk about your work on the uh, WHO committee. <clears throat> the final report was released some time ago. Everyone can go see it. We actually talked about it on TWIV, but nothing like the three of you to talk about it. So maybe we could start with um, just a bit of a history on the committee. You know, when was it established and what was the purpose? And uh, I don't know who wants to answer that, but you know, one of you can volunteer. Yeah, I can. I don't know the exact date, but but uh, there was a call for experts through the Global Outbreak and Response Network, GORN, um, to well to see who would would be willing to join this particular uh, group, um, and that was somewhere I don't know second half of uh, last year. So that's when what, what convened this group. Uh, but the initial thinking and the terms of reference had already been discussed for a while by WHO in their visits uh, in China. So between WHO and, and China and China CDC uh, on uh, what would be needed. So this whole uh, idea about trying to work together to dig down into what exactly happened uh, at the start of this pandemic. So that's, uh, so the, those terms of reference, the initial terms of reference were already there. And then the team was established and convened and we started to work online like all of us have been doing, including uh, our Chinese uh, counterparts. Um, and we, we, well, we jointly developed a more detailed plan of work because these terms of reference are pretty broad and you can, you know, you can read a lot or a little into it, depending on how you look at it. So the first things we did was really, you know, make a list of, so, let's say, study questions and studies um, to be done. Uh, and that work plan has been what we've been working along uh, all the time. And a lot of the preparatory work for that was done in China by a large group of, of uh, people. And when we visited China, we really dug down into the progress, uh, the details, the analysis, and then the, what you can and cannot conclude from that. 
I'm curious if you could, the three of you, tell us like what expertise do you bring uh, to this committee? I mean, we know, but for our listeners, um, maybe Peter, you could remind everyone. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was, um, um, I think, 2004 when I first started working in China on coronaviruses. I mean, you know, it, it's um, exactly what our organization set up to do is to look at origins of pandemics, find out why they emerge, and then try and do something with that to try and help prevent future pandemics. So it fits exactly with what, mm-hmm. what our organization does. And my specific background has, you know, I, I'm president of Eco Health Alliance, but I have two Two real areas that I continue active research in. One is in China on coronaviruses. The other is, in general, in Southeast Asia on the risk of future pandemics. So it really fits with what I've been doing. And I collaborated with not just Wuhan Institute of Virology, but a lot of other organizations in China Mm -hmm. over the years. So I was hoping that that would help, um, you know, and some of the getting to the bottom of some of the the data that's available and understanding what it all means. I, I, I think we go a long way, actually, um, in, in, even in that four-week period in China, but before that as well. Thea, how about you? What did you bring to the committee? Um, I think it was my background within uh, public health virology and training in outbreak management. Uh, I have trained uh, with the Center for Disease Control in the U.S. for two years completing the Epidemic Intelligence uh, Service Program, where you are trained in outbreak management and sent around to the United States and around the world to manage outbreaks. And I work with viral outbreaks. And since then, I've been uh, joining BORN and have been um, working with BORN on uh, on some outbreaks abroad. And I have been hitting the the public health virology reference laboratories in my home country in Denmark for uh, for almost a decade as well. So I think it's that combined experience. And Marion? Yeah, um, I think my special take on this is, is studies at the human-animal interface, including the molecular side of it. So what, uh, I have somewhat similar background to Tia. Um, I'm a veterinarian by background, but I work in a medical environment. I've worked in a medical public health environment. So I'm always tr- intrigued in, in spreading of viruses, the, the interplay between animals and, and people, the role of food in that. So that's my, uh, you know, my, mm-hmm. my okay. expertise. And so after uh, the uh, initial sort of online work and stuff, uh, you all went to China together and you were there for a month. Is that correct? That's correct. When uh, when exactly was that? Well, I went twice, didn't I? (laughs) (laughs) But you only landed once. I only landed once. Yeah, I I spent two days in in transit in in Qatar and then came back. But uh, yeah. Uh, And you had to quarantine So when you first got there and so you worked there but still... Uh, by Zoom or whatever. By Zoom. And it was interesting because we also experienced the uh, very strict quarantine and and entry rules Mm -hmm. with uh, pre-departure testing. It had to be uh, long enough before we would land. That was not possible because of transit. So we had to be retested in... um, uh, in, during transit oh, cool. with all the stress that came from that when some positives came up uh, had to be retested again uh, very very strict uh, which of course has helped in uh, China to to control mm. the outbreak uh, but even to this date when we were there uh, very stringent rules also on departure um, you could not get moved through the airport without your QR code that that was based on a recent uh, test uh, result. So very very strictly organized, and including then the quarantine, locked up <laughs> in a hotel for 14 days, um, and all we saw was the people that came to check our temperatures. Mm-hmm. And during that time, you're working on online, I guess, right? Yes. Yes. But then, of course, full time, which so so then you know the rest of your business is at least gone during the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that that you know that that you can move 
faster then. And then you, at some point you're allowed to go out, right, and visit um, various you, – you visited markets. Uh, I presume you visited the Wuhan Institute of Virology and so forth. And these were all planned ahead of time, I presume, right? No, they were actually just planned the last day of our full quarantine, where we had a long list of uh, places we uh, agreed upon, mm -hmm. first in the national team and then uh, discussed in the, the big team. And uh, to our, I think, pleasure, all the really important sites, they were accommodated and arranged, and we were okay. subsequently ready and able to visit. Okay. And in general, um, so it sounds like you... You asked for materials, and for the most part, did you get what you asked for, or would you say otherwise? Yeah, I think so. This has been out in in media and reports. So I, I I'm saying uh, that we got for the most part what we asked for because what we asked for was an incredible amount of studies, details, data. Um, um, and analysis. So, uh, and and you see that if you if you have seen the report, you see there's a lot of material there that has been uh, produced, collated, aggregated, analyzed. Uh, so that was a whole lot. Is that everything? No. Is that everything the way uh, you would do a protocol if you started from scratch? No. But that was also not how this. Uh, mission was started because the some of the work had already uh, been started based on recommendations from the WHO missions earlier, um, and then here come we come as an international team, and you cannot just say, "Oh, you should have done this entirely different." I mean, you 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 work respectfully with the the studies that that our colleagues have started. I think that's. A bit of a misunderstanding out yeah. there. That people I agree with that. I think, you know, it's funny, before we went out there, we I don't think we really knew what we would get in terms of data. You know, would we actually get samples and get them retested? Or, you know, th this was all discussed publicly by various people saying, uh, you know, they're going to retest samples, they're going to do that. But at some point when you get on the ground, you realize mm -hmm. these, this is hard work that people have done. I mean, I, I go back to the guy that did... Um, uh, Leo uh, Leo Jun that did the sampling in the market, 900 plus environmental samples from the Huanan seafood market during the middle of an outbreak of a disease that no one knew where this was going to end. And he, you know, putting himself at risk, catching animals and, uh, you know, swabbing stuff with potentially a lethal virus right there. Um, so he's done a huge amount of work that he's very proud of. You can't just then come in and say, oh, you did that all wrong. You really should have done it uh, in a very standardized way. So there's there's an element of you've got to have respect for your colleagues because we're in this for the long term. We, we've got phase one and phase two to really try and understand this. And we know that you're not going to find the origin of a brand new virus unless you're very lucky in a few months. It's going to take some time. Uh, so I, uh, actually, up front, I'm interested in that. You mentioned phase one and phase two. Can you uh, uh, elaborate on that? Because my understanding is that the report that's out there now, the visit that you've had, is not the final story, right? Uh, so if you could elaborate on phase one and phase two and, and what that all means. Thanks. If if I uh, if I can respond to you, Rick, because I think that that's a really important uh, discrimination for the entire world that has not been clear to everybody from the get-go, that this is only the very first step in a assumable long, long um, process where phase one, that's the arrangement and uh, agreement between WHO and China originally in the terms of reference. Those are the, what we call the phase one studies and they are available on the WHO uh, website where everybody can see the terms of references. So when we were in Wuhan now on this mission, our uh, primary um, uh, objectives were to review the data collected during these phase one studies and agree either on how to pursue uh, and, and um, follow some of these tracks and even as important, agree on maybe which tracks could be closed, which tracks were assumably 
based on the evidence presented to us, agreed upon not as being kind of hot tracks and, and things that needed to be continued or follow up. So it's a process where you review the data, arrange and you review the studies undertaken together jointly, but it's only the first step. And when I say first step, it's the first step on our international work in China, but the steps and the process began long time ago because WHO and China have been working on the terms of reference uh, and WHO has been in China on, uh, on two um, separate visits in 2020 to arrange for the terms of references for this first step. So thanks for making that clear. And now we are uh, jointly looking into the phase two studies, which are guided by the outcomes of the phase one studies. Yeah, there were a number of, um, in your report, a number of things you wanted to pursue, and yeah. I, that's part of phase two, right? Exactly. So that's uh, so part of that was already discussed in uh, when we were there, just to see what would be possible. Um, and a good example, I think, is the exploration of can you really not find older serum samples because that was is a critical study. Um, and when we were there, there was discussion with the people of the blood bank, and uh, they well, we left with the 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 remark that they were going to be make sure that they would be stored for for the purpose of doing sero serological studies. So in in the so we've made uh, recommendations and I think each of those recommendations is translatable into a follow up study and we have been uh, we have worked on that. Um, uh, and some of those studies are in China. Some of those studies are also outside of China. Um, and it's really a package and, and for, that, that needs to be done because there's different directions uh, and different hypotheses to, to dig further down into. I suppose that um, phase one, you one possibility might have been you found something clear and that would have been lucky, right? But you didn't, so you need to go on. I've mentioned this in, if you look at, uh, what was it? 30,000 plus uh, samples of a different range of animals. Yeah, 80,000. 80,000. So we tested a fraction of that and found that MERS oh, was sorry. probably linked to dromedary camels. That could have happened here as well, Yeah, but that yeah, didn't you, happen. Yeah, if you look at the animal um, details, 80,000 animals tested. And I've seen people say, well, look, they've, they've done this exhaustive survey, so why didn't they find the, the reservoir? Clearly, there's no intermediate house. Well, I mean, come on, this is, um, look at the animals that are in there. These are animals in zoos in some cases. These are animals, these are domestic animals like uh, pigs and chickens. It's unlikely to find a, a SARS-CoV reservoir. And, and to really do this well, you've got to do it in a structured, focused way to trace back. And I think what's important is the recommendations say that, and they say it about all the side, all sides of this, from the human side, the, the molecular side, the animal side, and it's agreed on with China. So China has signed off on this, that they also want to do phase two studies. They've agreed to do them. And I think that that's the real way we'll get to the bottom of where COVID came from, by actually working together to do that. And there really is no other option, in my opinion. Can you elaborate a little more on the challenges of finding the intermediate host? Well, um, look, geographically or like yeah, mustelids I mean, and felines or well, let's let's go back to SARS. Uh, <laughs> SARS had emerged in Guangdong in 2003. Um, and um, you know, luckily, Guan Yi went into the market and from Hong Kong University and sampled civets. WHO sent a team in that did a bunch of other veterinary work around the markets, and luckily the animals were still there. And luckily, they found evidence of SARS coronavirus in those animals. So that became evidence of an intermediate host. But when they went to farms of, of civets, they didn't find any evidence shortly after. Um, if that market had been cleaned out, like the Huanan Seafood Market was, uh, they wouldn't have found that evidence. And it would have taken a lot longer to really get the full story of, of what happened with SARS. Um, so... You know, the, the way to do the animal sampling is really important. You've got to target the, the geography and the, the species correctly, and you've got to do um, a, a, the correct sample size so you've got some confidence that a negative finding means that it really didn't have it. 
or that a negative finding means you've got to do a lot more work to really be confident about that. And yeah. we're just at the beginning of that. Yeah. And uh, MERS is not really a fair comparison either because camels are crawling with it, right? Exactly. So that I was going to comment on that too. And there, your your very very minimal screen turned out to you know pointed at the smoking gun because there's a hundred percent zero prevalence. Right. Yeah. If that had been four percent, we may might easily have been looking for it for much longer, because then maybe you need to find certain spots, uh, uh, hot spots, uh, pockets where that may have happened. And this is very well still the scenario that we may be looking at. Um, so if you look, uh, for instance, we've done studies with, with mink. Uh, um, and uh, if you, so our mink farms were very closely uh, spaced. So there too, because in, in mink, the transmission of SARS-CoV is very fast. Uh, serology already gave gave things away, but if you have that in a region where that same uh, farming is much more interspersed, you may test a lot of farms and not find anything. Um, and those are some real challenges. So, so ruling out is very difficult. I think from the work that was done, um, my take on it is that for for instance for poultry for pigs for for uh, cattle the sampling was quite comprehensive so there were a couple of hundreds for 20 something different different uh, states that is to me saying well it's quite unlikely there but many of the other animals is 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 as you do a bit anecdotal it's it's a broad sweep it's not yet systematic. Yeah, I'm thinking of it sort of uh, being an analogy of looking for a needle in a haystack, but you're not even sure you're looking for a needle. You could be looking for a thimble or a pencil or something else. And yeah. So far, you did a lot of, of review of epidemiological data from patients. You, you, you looked at the samples and, and you basically conclude that there's no signature of, of transmission before December 2019. Is that is that a fair conclusion? Not. Yeah. So it's quite important that it says that there is no signal of substantial transmission prior to December, but that does not exclude that there has been uh, smaller outbreaks or even no higher level of transmission, but just not substantial because we don't see the. Um, the signal with symptomatic uh, strong appearance, neither in the healthcare system nor in the surveillance uh, system based on both in, inpatient and outpatient. Uh, maybe that's where this, uh, I picked out a phrase out of the report uh, in the summary that says, sequence data also showed some diversity of viruses already existed in the early phase of the outbreak in Wuhan, suggesting unsampled chains of transmission beyond the uh, Hunan market clusters. Is that relevant in this regard? That there was enough, if I, is that saying that there was, you found sufficient sequence diversity to suggest that this thing had been uh, transmitted in humans for a period of time beyond uh, beyond whatever contaminated the Wuhan market. Yes, exactly. And that does not rule out the Wuhan market because that could have been a month earlier at the same market. <laughs> but by the time the first people were, the, or the first people for which there now was sequence data, there was already that diversity. So they really were not the first cluster. So could you uh, 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 sequence for me the events in the Wuhan market relative to the identification of an outbreak? And then at some point they closed the market and then uh, at some point sampling was done. I don't understand quite what the sequence of events, the temporal sequence of events was. And then then obviously you guys showed up, but by then it's uh, all the <laughs> opportunities for sampling really are are gone, right? You can just not look all right. gone, not all gone. Okay. I, mean, I think this is something important that needs to be said. That okay, there are tons you could do. I mean, you know, there are people who work there. Um, there are people who worked in the wildlife farms. There's, you can go back and interview them. You can go back and retest them. Uh, look for antibodies, uh, memory T cells. All this, all this work that could be done. 
So there's still a lot you can do. But I just want to get to that issue of the timing is really something that we all looked at very carefully and and kind of independently because Taya was running the Epi Group and they interviewed, um, they, they spoke to people on the China side around the Epi um, uh, human uh, sampling of the sample, you know, the sort of custody of samples and when it when they were handed over and where they went. And and we looked at this from the animal side and, and Marion from the from the molecular side. And we got the same, you know, the same data, the same details that that uh, right at the end of end of December, I think it was the 29th, there was a meeting called at 2 p.m. in the afternoon in the in the um, first hospital to have um, clusters uh, of patients. Um, and to report it up the chain. And then within two days, China CDC is on the ground. The market's been closed and, and decontaminated. Um, and then China CDC sends people in to do environmental swabbing of what's left. And there is quite a lot left. I mean, you know, I think that's important to know. There were live animals still there, um, snakes, um, you know, amphibians. Um, there was there were animals in freezers that were left behind that could be swabbed, um, and they were and they were tested. So I think that you know there's a lot been said about the closure of a market, but at the time, Ch the Chinese government said that this originated in a wildlife market, a, a, a seafood market that also sold wild animals uh, or wildlife products. Um, so they thought that that could be a source, and they did what you would do if you wanted to control an average. You would get the people out of there, test them all, quarantine those that are infected, get them in hospital, clean it out and close the market and then send the scientists in to test. Um, very rapidly, I thought. Yeah, but maybe also good to understand that because the first uh, two cases that were picked up by uh, one of the doctors that we also met, um, so they had contact with the market and then there was a, a, a call around and then there mm. were more cases around the market so the initial case definition was people with this yeah. disease linked to the market so of course it then you find cases linked to the market so that's a self-fulfilling prophecy and only later that that was broadened a bit and that was also part of the challenge that that, that Tia uh, led. Uh, is how broad was that then? And and uh, so yeah, go. I'll hand over to Tia for that the, that that bit. Um, and what we made so we made a point of trying to get from all angles, also the including the molecular data, uh, get to the earliest possible cases because that of course is the more informative if you. Are already in a you know in an outbreak situation, then you have the onward person-to-person -person transmission that doesn't tell you about origins, and a lot of the work in the epi in the molecular epi with the animals really was aimed at trying to dig back. So, what is the earlier, 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 earliest case that is recognized? Um, so that that was the process, and and where with the information now the earliest confirmed recognized case is a person that and that survived <laughs> is a person that we also met uh, but the work that the happy work that suggests that there will have been you know many more cases that have not been uh, recognized there is also no sequence data for those um, and that's part of the digging back uh, that you would want to do so what were the earliest cases and to what extent or not uh, do they have any association with the market? So the first, uh, the earliest now recognized case is uh, with an onset date of December 8th um, with no contact to neither the Huanan wet market or other uh, markets. The closest kind of market contact is uh, a mother who has cooked for the case and who has uh, bought some of her, um, her cooking ingredients, that's an unnamed market. Uh, but the person in the case um, has not no contact, and no contact to wild animals except for being in proximity of meters to a, a wild street cat. That's kind of the only... Um, <laughs> so in your report, there's a map of the, mar the Huanan market, and 
it seems to me mo most of the cases are on one side, right? Mm -hmm. uh, very few on the other. Is that, what does that mean, if anything? <laughs> oh, in the market. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that means much. I mean, look, the, um, there are human cases and there are environmental swabs from the market. And we looked long and hard at that to see if there were, there were patterns there. And it, it doesn't really hold up. And once you go to the market and you you see it and you realize what what this market is, it's not. It, it comes across as a. It's called a wholesale seafood market, and and in in the Europe and the US, we think of a frozen food market. It's not that at all. It's it's a pretty old um, uh, market with narrow alleyways that sells live animals bred in farms across China. Live amphibians, fish. Even crocodiles were heard, giant salamanders, turtles that are butchered probably in front of you. And the all the mess that comes out of that typical wet market situation is thrown on the floor and washed out twice a day. We were told that the this the the alleyways is cleared out, washed out twice a day. The grids there then get all these gut piles and stuff in, in the grids. And there were some quite, you know, there's some some um, PCR positives around those grids and around the stalls. But I think at this point, knowing that there's likely a bigger transmission event going on, knowing there are people moving in and out who are probably infected, and there may have been animals infected in there, we don't know, um, uh, that, that you can't really read too much into exactly where in the market those positives are. And that's my take on it. I don't know what you think. Sorry. I'm wondering for a, kind of maybe a question for Thea about knowing what we do what we know now about asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic transmission, how does that complicate doing this sort of epidemiology of way back when? And maybe it's, uh, that. I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges. You're just you know, kneeling there because we have so many, uh, like Marion just um, summarized, we have so many uh, documented uh, missing cases in the transmission chain that have uh, most likely been either asymptomatic or very mild cases. And knowing this now, what we what we didn't know back when SARS all, or COVID uh, all started being, um, being part of the early epidemic in Wuhan, nobody knew this. But knowing what we know now, we would have immediately traced back in a different way. We would not have had included any geographical location in the case definition, but had it occurred in Denmark, it's very likely it has been the exact same story. But we would have had very broad case definition and you would have divided it into very mild cases, etc. And all of this one year later means that we will have a lot of blanks in our transmission chains. It's unavoidable. It, it happened yeah. in China, but it would happen the same my, my best um, convention is this would happen the same situation. We would be in the same situation everywhere in the world where the first epidemic took place without knowing that there were asymptomatic and mild cases among these very early cases. And it's really a main challenge because what surveillance system picks up asymptomatic cases like zero? <laughs> so, yeah. And you probably can't even fill in those blanks with something like serology or something because there's no timeline for uh, when somebody got infected, right? So you're you're stuck with what you got. Well, the the but that's where the uh, so we all were excited about the opportunity for blood banks uh, for blood donation. Ah, okay. Yes. That, if if they are collected, you know, if there's enough of it, then you can actually do fine granular serology. So then you could actually find small pockets and then maybe maybe i mean it's it's it has some of the same challenges but certainly if you would be able to do that on stored samples so not serology now because that doesn't tell you much but the serology from blood bank samples november 2019 could point at earlier pockets somewhere and and we have proposed and discussed that quite at length to, to uh, maybe take the take the the molecular data because there's also early case reporting with almost identical sequences from other parts of China, and there's very early reporting. Not sure exactly, but sequences from Italy. Uh, so you would want to do a 
serological study with the same methods in different parts which have the earliest evidence of circulation. And then maybe see if that leads to pockets which, which, where you can then again can, can go and, and, and figure out an interview and see if there's any common risk factors. So, so whereas this might not only lead to the, because I, I just follow up on your uh, chain of question, Rick, this might not necessarily only answer or might not answer questions related to direct transmission chains, but it will give you the clear biological documentation that there was virus circulating prior to the big epidemic outbreak. Yeah. So it has this very important uh, purpose. And the fact that we managed to meet with the director of the Wuhan Blood Donor Center and make this arrangement and have a commitment that the, the routine destruction of blood after two years will not be taking place in their uh, storages before the study is undertaken. I think that's one of the really promising new um, yeah. tracks we're going to follow. And as Marion mentions, this can be done elsewhere in China, but time is, the clock is ticking because yeah. elsewhere it will be destroyed after two years. So really it's very, very important that and uh, not only for the other tracks to go cold, <laughs> the risk of that every day that uh, this um, the phase two studies are not uh, initiated, uh, but, but also for the blood in the blood banks elsewhere in the southeastern um, regions and provinces where the molecular epi has suggested high homology to some of the genomic sequences identified in Wuhan, this needs to be done. And it would be a great uh, asset to actually have these serology surveys and zero uh, surveys undertaken both in Wuhan and elsewhere. And then, like Marion says, the methodology needs to be, of course, um, highest standard and compatible with the same method conducted outside of China as well, where it will be highly relevant to, uh, to continue this work. So it's, it's really like the club is ticking and we need to move on with these, um, with these studies. I would say. Peter, I is there um, going to be tracing of the wildlife chains from the market back into the fields where they came from? Yeah, it's kind of, I was just thinking that as Taylor was talking, talk about um, barriers put in the way. You know, China did what was actually a good public health measure and closed down the wildlife farms that are breeding animals for markets like the Huanan seafood market. Um, you know, the, um, these are the farms in all across China that are breeding bamboo rats, civets, porcupines, ferret badgers, raccoon dogs for food, and are shipping them usually live into markets. And China made a, a, a decision on the 24th of February, 2020. And I remember that because that's my brother's birthday. And um, they said, we're going to close. It was quite a shocking decision. We're going to close all of the wildlife farms um, for public health reasons. So I think that's a really telling thing. And by the way, that's 14 million people that were employed in that industry. Um, and it was worth about 70 seven billion dollars a year in, in 2016. So this is a big decision and we know that they've done that um, to a lot of these farms because we used to EcoFlyers used to work with some of these farmers who are now doing other work. I mean one of the one of the folks we used to work with is now producing coat hangers um, in what used to be uh, bamboo wrap and porcupine and civet farms. Um, so they did that for public health purposes. That means that tracing back the actual animals is is going to be very difficult or impossible. There may still be some farms open. There may still be farms that are breeding animals for fur, which we know they're kept open to some extent. But the people are there. And just as Taya said, if you look at the logic of how that pathway could have operated, we know that the nearest, the nearest known relatives to SARS-CoV-2 are in Yunnan province. There are also the pangolin viruses from Guangxi and Guangdong. We know that wildlife farms in those provinces were supplying animals into the Huanan market. Um, it would be really critical, and it's in the recommendations, to go to those specific farms and neighboring farms in those provinces, interview the farmers, talk to their relatives and contacts, take samples, test them for antibodies. If there's a very high prevalence, it might mean something. 
look at the suppliers, ask them how they supplied, where were these animals butchered? Such a huge amount of work you could do. And again, I have the same fear that Taya has, that if we if we don't get on with this um, as quickly as possible, we do begin to lose the ability to do that follow-up. And don't forget, Chad has agreed to do this. It's in the recommendations. So let's move. So uh, the, just to clarify, uh, there does not need to be an intermediate host, correct? This could be direct spillover into humans, right? I think this is something a lot of people don't understand. Yeah, just to quickly, we, we did see that in what we'd done with communities in China where we were finding seropositive people in rural villages that are close to bat colonies that carry these SARS-related coronaviruses. People seropositive with antibodies to bat SARS-related coronaviruses that can't be co corrupt SARS-CoV, because this was back in 2015, um, way after the antibodies would have waned, and these people had not traveled and weren't part of the COVID SARS outbreak, and weren't part of the COVID outbreak, because it was years prior. So exposure to these viruses is probably pretty common across rural China and Southeast Asia. As you, as you all know, the highly related viruses are now being picked up outside of China, right? Yeah. So what's the possibility that it actually began elsewhere and not in China? I'm sure you've, you've thought about that, right? Yeah, I do. And that's also, I mean, there's been criticism for, uh, for instance, for us saying we may also need to look outside of China. It makes perfect sense. If you look, for instance, at the animal potential uh, bat reservoir host, well, that is geographically, of course, also outside of China. If you look at the two independent uh, virus sequences from pangolin, that's a route that brings in animals from a vast geographic region. Um, so uh, so it, it, it should be uh, following a clear logic, but it can very well be outside of China. Yeah, I think yeah, we've got Cambodia, Thailand, Japan with related viruses. And, you know, on the China side, um, it's if you look at the the sampling bias, um, that group in Wuhan working with EcoHealth Alliance, uh, I think there is something like almost twenty thousand bat samples now. How many samples from Myanmar, from Laos, from Cambodia? Um, so there is a bias that needs to be looked at. So anyway, I, I really do think it's pretty logical that that needs to be looked at as well as southern China. Yeah, you have a, a line in your report. The lineage giving rise to SARS-CoV-2 has been circulating unnoticed in bats for decades. And that just says our our sampling just hasn't been good enough, right? Yeah, yeah or at least that's the, if, if you, uh, yeah, so so the relationships there, um, there's been some quite interesting papers, phylogeny papers that, that have looked at that and they really, you know, if, if you take out all the recombination uh, uh, parts and then do the, the the dating with what we now know of the, the, the rate of, of evolution of this virus, then it is decades. So there's a big piece missing, <laughs> which could have happened in bats, which could have happened somewhere else. The reason why the some intermediary host at present so there's the story, of course, of closing down specific, uh, uh, you know, production facilities, uh, but also what argues at, at the moment, what may argue against it is that we have seen, we haven't seen a lot of new sparks in China, mm. uh, which there have been some, but those have not been, so the ones where there has been sequencing have not been with, like, say, close to the original virus. They were viruses that, you know, could be linked to travelers or... Um, so so that is something you might expect if this was a common and widespread intermediary host, you would expect to see new sparks. Yeah, yeah. Unless, of course, it was a combination with some chance event within a certain animal group with some mutations or um, and and that you know took off well so you end up with four scenarios for emergence right and 
you know, zoonotic, intermediate zoonotic. And then one of them is introduction to the cold food chain. And I'm wondering if you could comment on wh why that's there. Wh what kind of evidence is there for that? Who, who wants to come on that? Marion, you want Yeah, to so um, this is, of course, uh, uh, an area of considerable discussion. So what really started it, so we all were on the, on the you know, on the hesitant side on that one initially, but uh, then we were presented with uh, some very, very detailed uh, investigation work by China in some of the new outbreaks after the initial Wuhan outbreak, and one particular in Beijing, which was related, it, it spread just like Wuhan, and they did a really fancy outbreak investigation, and the 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 risk factor that came up was a link to a food product and then they've gone out and they have done extensive testing of food packages uh, and have found very few positives with sequences on them uh, and that, of course, is a lot of discussion. So there, if you have that in the middle of a pandemic and you have food imported into a country, frozen, and it may be handled in a, some, some other uh, area where the pandemic is fully raging, for instance, by a person that is positive, it's possible that you contaminate a package like that and transport a virus like that and then... Uh, it could be possible. It's, of course, not logic as the first event because the virus needs to come from somewhere but what we observed also in the market is that there was a lot of frozen food including wild animal meat frozen so then the question is if that's now a susceptible potential uh, reservoir host that you freeze how does that work and there were uh, and, and we all think that coronaviruses are not so stable uh, with free thawing, but some uh, experiments have been done in, I forgot the group, uh, Peter, maybe. You can US, yes, yeah, Singapore. Yeah, in the US, a group that spiked fish, froze it, thawed it three weeks later and could perfectly well culture the viruses out of it. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's why we said, okay, we cannot rule it out. And look, the, the wildlife, it's not like um, a skinned um, thigh of a deer was frozen in the, in, in the market. It, these were carcasses of ferret badgers, which are a known coronavirus reservoir. So if, there's a, if there are live animals coming in like that, that's a, that's a risk factor. If there are frozen carcasses, we don't know where they were butchered, we don't know where they came from, it's a risk factor. Um, and we, we, I think we came, came to the conclusion it was possible, not likely or very likely, but possible. And I think that's. Powerful. But you didn't find any any frozen carcasses in the market positive, right? No. Yeah, but I mean, there weren't many. Okay. By, by the time they got in there, I think there were something like six ferret badges that they looked at, and it was a small mm -hmm. number that were left. And there are also some other market involvements too, besides the Huanan, correct? Yeah. But also there. Were there environmentally positive specimens as well? Yes, some, and that's uh, so. That's a bit of so. So that that's more the 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 current surveillance in China. There was a, a cluster again last week. I think um, I haven't heard. I have sent email to George Gao. Like <laughs> I haven't heard about the sequence yet. But um, so. So uh, yeah, the Qingdao as well was another one. Yeah, yeah, and those are um, well. The, so the current conclusion from China, based on their studies, is that those are um, introductions through the frozen food chain. Um, we discussed uh, some of that, and we said, "Well, you, you, you really to to really really nail that down, you would need to." sequence all new cases to make sure that you do not have sort of hidden circulation, for instance, in the people handling the big food shipments, uh, you know, repacking. That's also very, very, you know, that that's plausible. If, if you look at uh, what happens with, uh, with food, this is a big market. 
So I don't think the the final word on that is out yet. So it's very clear that with respect to this, the food market, there's a lot of work to be done yet, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Can we <clears throat> can we tackle the elephant in the room? <laughs> Seven. So what your your fourth uh, scenario is laboratory incident, and you know this has been going on for a year. We started with deliberate creation, and I think we've moved away from that, and now we're into accidental release. And I would love to hear your thoughts on that. P perhaps all of you actually. Including sort of your interaction with uh, the laboratory during your visit and, and around. I mean, you you did visit the lab, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and we'd love to know what you came away from from that with. So, Marion, go ahead, start, please. Yeah, so um, so there are three labs involved. So we, did, we, we made a point of talking to all the laboratories that had been involved in, in part of the response. So these are two public health laboratories, the city uh, CDC lab and then the provincial CDC lab, and then there was the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And uh, in all of those, we visited and we discussed, uh, you know, we, we talked about what, well, explain to us what you have been doing uh, from when on that you work, you know, get, get, get these samples, what has been your role in the, in the uh, uh, outbreak, how uh, you know, we looked at the facilities, we discussed uh, the training, we discussed uh, the, the health uh, uh, checks that they performed. And uh, in our meeting with the Wuhan uh, team, of, of course, we also discussed the, the, uh, you know, the accusations out there and the suspicions out there. And um, we asked about why did you take the database offline, which is, you know, recirculated in the news a lot. And they explained to us why they did that. And we asked about, there's another story about a, was it a master student, I think? Yeah, technician. Um, um, and they explained to us what happened there, and 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 uh, we, we asked about their health check program, um, and they explained what they did. And based on that, well, we had no reason. I had no reason to conclude that there was anything uh, weird uh, there. Uh, plus none of that was in the so we've all always discussed also in the team if we would have any indication from the study so far that there would be the possibility of a lab link we would follow it it's not it's not a secret it's not off the table we just did not have any uh, evidence or indication and uh, in the way of working, we have said we have to keep following the leads from the science. So that's why that's just not a, a high high uh, on the table. Yeah. Well, I um, I also have. Um, I mean, we were sent there, so I felt like the rest of the team a huge amount of responsibility to get these questions on the table, even though some of these questions were difficult and they were clearly, um, some of them over the, the, the limit. Um, if you keep on asking uh, the people sitting right in front of you, so did you test the staff routinely? What were the results of the serology testing? Was anybody had left the lab that you have not mentioned yet? Anybody missing here and the rounds of serology and the rounds of testing? Has anybody fall ill that you have or felt? Did anybody fall ill but you have not recorded this for any reasons? Like kind of all these more interrogative questions. They were there and they were put on the table because this is way too important uh, a cause not to. So I would say I have the I carried the feeling of being impolite, but that when we were raising these questions, but I would say that nothing was left in the pocket out of politeness. It all came out on the table. And we were a huge group. So even though we might have different takes on the on on any of these issues, 
it was not possible not to have anybody asking all the questions they wanted to. It was simply done throughout each of the questioning of the labs, of the hospitals, etc. Everybody got a chance to fire all those questions. So we were really supplementing each other. So I, I got away with the, the understanding from all the answers given that this was not likely to have happened. Yeah. And this is based only on questioning, not co us coming with swaps and testing or serology follow-up or looking into lab logs um, because it was not a lab audit. We were there to question and to interview uh, together. So what you could get out of that, I think that there were no questions spared. Everything was on the table. And um, so it was... Yeah. It was not obvious that something should have been going on. That, uh, that then I think we would have come across it with all our joint questions put together throughout these sessions. So that is my um, my take on it. Peter, yeah, I think you know. I think people misunderstand what we were doing on this mission. You know, our our role was to look at these pathways, these hypotheses, and come to some sort of initial conclusion based on evidence in the literature and what we found out in our, in our meetings with the China side and our trip as to which one of them, um, which ones of them are more likely and which one of them, the ones of them are less likely. And that's what we did. And, and we did that based on, you know, uh, early on in, in the trip to China, we arranged for uh, Xi Zhongli, the, um, the lead of that back coronavirus group in the Wuhan lab to present all of her findings to us. So we could get a, a feel for what's going on. We asked her questions there, and that was in, in the first two weeks. Um, I presented to the group on everything that EcoHealth's been doing in China and what we found. And then we went to lab, and we really did get into. I I don't you know I don't um, uh, I, I see the the comments about how how this wasn't a, a lab audit, but it wasn't designed to be. It was designed to be a, a survey to understand the most likely and the least likely, and that's what we did. The questions we asked, as Ter says, were tough questions. I mean, I never thought that I would be sat there in the Wuhan lab directly facing the senior staff and the director of the Institute of Virology and saying, why, why did you remove someone from a website and that's been accused of them being a missing person? The, their answer is absolutely normal for labs. That, that, you know, they left. They now live somewhere else and they don't want to be interviewed. Fine. Um, you know, what, what are we supposed to do? We insist on interviewing. No, that's that's our question and answer. You know, why did you take down the databases? Why were you working in the Mojang miner uh, with the miners? Why why didn't you publish a paper saying that this could have been SARS? These sorts of things. And the answers we got were consistent with everything that's been put out there and with what anyone else in the team would have done in those circumstances. Um, you don't publish a paper on some miners where the results are inconclusive. If you don't find positive SARS in people who died of pneumonia in mind, it's not going to be a paper that's going to be published. These sorts we, of things, yeah. you know. It, we it, discussed culture programs. Could there yeah. be, uh, you know, uh, hit, uh, error in the culturing? We, in, we, we really dug down in that also from the, you know, the lab technical uh, perspective. Uh, so it's... It, the, just not nothing popped up that really well, one, sort of raised heard, question. Yeah, one thing that I heard from the lab director that I thought was very interesting. He said, "In you know, and he speaks okay English." Uh, and he said, "You know, we, we were asking him all these questions about they call them rumors over there. We call them conspiracy theories." And he said, basically, in in sort of his version of English, we've not responded to those rumors because. If you do that, you give them oxygen. So I think people misunderstand the, chi the, the Chinese government, and he's a Chinese government worker at senior level, running a lab, um, not speaking up about when, when they're accused. The reason is, he stated quite clearly, they don't want to um, give oxygen to these conspiracies. They're unfounded. And every now and again, they make a statement, that is simply not true. What do you do? And we asked them those questions, and they said the same things. I'm sure all of you have seen this letter to science last week from a number of scientists saying we need to investigate the origin. Does that not drive you crazy since that's what you're doing? 
Yes, I must say it was a bit surprising um, because what else would you do? I mean, yeah, so uh, <laughs> apart from, you know, an audit, yeah, open the books, open the freezer, show everything, which is an, a special, an inspection. That's a very different uh, mechanism. Um, and the, I, I'm, I have my doubts that that would yield anything new. Um, uh, and other than that, uh, so so what we've also said because that's I think what is a bit f- what I personally find a bit uh, annoying is that this keeps coming back with based on intelligence we think such and so and then there's no information and uh, so we've said from the get go it was as Tia mentioned uh, we we may we worked on getting the lab as a hypothesis in our synthesis diagram. That was not immediately obvious that that would happen. It was there. And we have continued to say, well, if you have evidence, then maybe share it confidentially with WHO, and then we can have a look. I I remember Uh, that. Do you remember that? But without any real evidence that you can look at, then you're stuck. It's a gridlock. Um, and that I find a bit yeah. frustrating in this whole discussion. I, re- I remember that uh, Intel, because it was put out in January when we were in lockdown um, because the Trump administration was still in power. And on the last week, I think Secretary of State Pompeo put out a fact sheet where he said that there were people in the Wuhan lab that were sick um, based on intelligence. And I remember putting out a tweet saying, um, Please share that information. You have my email address. Send us the information. We'll share it with the rest of the WHO team and we'll look into it. And we did ask them that. We asked about this report and they said, you know, they gave us information. It's in the report, in the annex. So we, you know, if there is information, it should be shared and then we can look at it. And in in the recommendation for the lab um, hypothesis pathway, um, it clearly states, and we clearly have all signed off on this, that, um, further information should what are the next steps to if there's further information comes up that should be followed up so far there is no further actual information sorry to over to you yeah no I was just going to say that um I, there would always be somebody who's more clever than the most clever man on earth and uh, <laughs> what happens when you're still woman what happens now <laughs> a woman of this? <laughs> And that's a woman, exactly. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but, but what happens if you keep on these uh, this focus? I mean, if there was a human mistake, or incidentally, or accidentally, or whatever, it needs to be figured out. It's very, it's too important to not work on this. So I think none of us would ever disagree that this needs to be followed. If somebody has clear leads, clear evidence, it should be shared, and we would all go for that one. But until then, let's keep the focus on the most likely scenarios because it's too important to be missed right now. What is happening is the struggle between scientists, who is the most clever or who has the biggest um, evidence, (laughs) whatever. Uh, Yes, sorry. In the meantime, sorry, it's my English. But in the meantime, uh, we are not following all these obvious leads and all these recommendations. Right now, everything is stolen. And I think this is really devastating. Who is to be blamed for all this uh, stalling if it's not the scientists producing all these kind of... uh, non-evidential uh, accusations or, or et cetera, if, if, we, if everything stops in the meantime. So I think really it should be separated in two paths and everybody with uh, evidence for the lab hypothesis should work on that and, and move forward. But the rest, I think, should be able to move forward with the most likely scenario and try to follow all the good leads created by the phase one studies. Yeah, and, and to add to what Ty said, the evidence right now, well, for the lab side, it's political. It's from an intel agency that's that's not been shared. Um, that's not scientific. And what, what I think scientists are doing is they're, they're talking about that it's possible. That's not disputed. We did not say in the WHO report that it's not possible. We said it's extremely unlikely. Um, and, and, you know, I think that it's fine for scientists to, to say that this should be investigated, but 
if the only evidence you've got is something you can't see because it's intelligence, and that even the intelligence, people who've seen the intelligence are quoted in, this week in the press saying that it doesn't, there's no evidence of hospitalization and it's unclear what they were sit with. It's not something that you could really reasonably launch a major audit of. Um, and I think that we do have things that we need to get to work on, both on the epi side and the animal side. It's a one health thing that needs to happen right now, and it's not happening. I think it's the challenge that proving a negative is just yeah. impossible. Yeah, right? That's right. And and and, uh, and, and that's what uh, we run the risk indeed of losing the momentum for the real work that needs to be done. And yeah. Well, yeah, there's, there's a great quote I saw on a, on a lab leak um, tweet was if you mix politics with science, you get politics. <laughs> that was pretty good. I, really <laughs> that. I like that. It rings true right now. That's very uh, good. Uh, what What is the timeline now for phase two? What What are all of you doing and, and when will we hear next steps? Yeah, so we've been working on uh, translating those recommendations that we made into what kinds of studies do we really think are needed now. Uh, and we are waiting for the outcome of the discussions at the World Health Assembly, where, of course, that, so where some of this uh, is, uh, again, discussed and looked at. It was our understanding that there is quite quite substantial support from countries. So WHO works like this. They need a mandate from the country. So, um, uh, I, so the, it was our understanding that there's, there's positive support for that to happen, but uh, it needs to be decided. Uh, and we are really, we have expressed that quite uh, repeatedly that, come on guys, decide. <laughs> Because we want to move on. In fact, even in the US, where the politics have been, has been particularly polarized, um, the White House has repeatedly said that they urged WHO to proceed with phase two studies as quickly as possible. Even this week, it's been restated. That is absolutely uh, correct and, and fully support that. Um, we all want that. The people who wrote that letter to science want that. Um, you know, that that needs to happen so we can understand where this thing came from and protect against future outbreaks. Yeah. Peter, do you think uh, eventually you'll get an answer to that question? The origin of COVID? Yep. Yeah, I do. I mean, look, I, I um, people talk about Ebola. I saw David Quarman tweeting about Ebola. That's a tough one. Um, we know from, we know from uh, SARS-CoV that the bats that carry the progenitor clade for this this virus are probably out there somewhere. They can be found with a concerted effort in a, in a year or two. Um, we know that the wildlife farms um, can be traced back and tested. We know that the epi can be done. It's China can do this. They have the capacity and the skills. And, you know, uh, the, the collaborations that we've all been involved in would, would absolutely show that you can do this. Thayer, do you think you... Uh your team will find the origin of SARS-CoV-2? I think that this team has a fair good chance mm -hmm. there um, of finding the origin. If we get the chance to move on, um, then yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. How about you, Marion? Yeah, uh, getting close to it, uh, or at least, you know, getting as much support as possible for one of the scenarios. And I think that's possible. Well, but perhaps after your uh, next phase two, uh, and you presumably gone to China and back again, we could have you back and we can talk about it again in the future. That would be great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for now, I'm going to thank you all um, for joining us. Um, Peter Dashak from EcoHealth Alliance. Thanks so much, Peter. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Thea Colson Fisher from Norgellens Hospital in Denmark. Thank you for joining us, Thea. By the invitation, very, very much enjoyed it. And from the Erasmus Medical Center, Mar Marion Kopmans. Thank you, Marion. Very good, and thank you uh, for having us. And uh, I, I, good luck with your work. It's really important. We recognize it. I think this was a great uh, conversation for the world to hear today. 
uh, and uh, looking forward to releasing it. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank this you. Radio. This is great. Thanks. Great to see you all again. Great to see you today. Great to see you, Marion. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I thought that was a good. That was great conversation. You know, they had, that was great. They they said things that they probably said to people before, but nobody. <laughs> writes them or anything they only write them. well it's also nice to have the i mean that was a nice lengthy discussion so everything yeah. you know we went through everything and i think it was balanced you know i think we so. got science from from a to z and you got to see it um uh come out of the people who were there and and feel their passion for understanding the origin and their frustration with the distractions and, and also the the different expertise that they each mm -hmm. bring to it, and and then this idea of you know the clock is running and we need to get these serum samples, yeah, for not sure. just from Wuhan but from everywhere, and we need to you know be able to go out and test people in the rural wildlife farms, and you know it, yeah, I, and, I really like those. And, you know, any writers who are listening to this, you know. These are really dedicated, talented people, right? <laughs> They're the best people to be doing this. Yeah, and you know stuff like Kathy, that uh, link that you found, that you found, or, or uh, I first became aware of because you sent it to me of the uh, debunking of the codon in the Furin site mm -hmm. thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, because I've had several emails from people saying, what about this? What about this? So that, that first surfaced in that Nicholas Wade article, okay? What about the Furin and, cleavage site? I and, that too. <laughs> you know, uh, even if he doesn't understand the science, Nicholas Wade could have, if he was responsible, really looked into that and find out, is there really anything to this? And he would have found out, no, there's nothing to it. But it doesn't help his story okay he didn't bother uh, he thought he understood it a year ago this was debunked with the codon business a year ago he didn't bother to look it up and that's what they all do they don't bother to, to look up the science and they think they know and then what kills me is my colleagues scientists send me emails saying this this guy sounds like he's right and i'm like what are you out of your mind <laughs> Yeah. I mean, there, there's there's you know misstatements of fact in the in the Wade article. For instance, he he talks about something uh, at somebody sending in a, a letter to uh, Nature Communications, and that's or Nature Medicine, and you know that's like an opinion. No, when you look on the Nature site, letters are short reports of original research focused on an outstanding finding. They're not opinion. They're two different. So as soon as I hit factual mistakes like that, you know, and then, you know, saying that there's no other beta coronavirus that that has this fear and cleavage site. And nah. that's not true. Nope. And there's uh, there's also this repeated reference to the State Department memo that was left behind on the 15th of January, five days before the inauguration, that, I'm sorry, was a blatant attempt to leave behind all of this innuendo and rumor fingering China uh, as some sort of uh, evildoer in the origins of the virus that, would, by the way, was taken down on the day of the inauguration. And that, that State Department memo is just atrocious, absolutely atrocious, but it won't go away. Even if it's taken down, it won't go away. And people keep coming back to it. It drives me nuts. We, didn't we go through that and, and debunk yes, it did. point by point? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we did. We did. It's not, there's nothing there. There's absolutely there's nothing. nothing there. And not only that, but we've, a lot of the stuff in that memo, we've uh, gone through over time yeah. as this has evolved. For example, the uh, State Department's uh, inspection of the Wuhan lab that was held up by Pompeo uh, as being a, a big deal that when you actually look into it is nothing, if anything, laudatory of the lab. Drives yeah. me nuts. Yeah. Um, so I agree with you, Vincent, journalists out there listening to this, for God's sake, be careful because we need to know where this actually came from. <laughs> All right. Don't, yep. don't mess it up. Now, what gets me is that we went through this a year ago, folks, 
in, the, in this Wall Street Journal article that just came out, they're rehashing the same stuff we went over a year ago. It's like, what, there's not enough news these days? You got to bring this up? There's nothing new. I don't get it. But yeah, I'd like their point was that if you get you distract us, we're not going to find out the actual yeah. origin, which is really important. Well, I was also interested in the uh, in the I, I appreciated your question at the end, Vincent, of are you going to get the answer? Okay, mm -hmm. and there seemed to be a mm, uh, some variation in perspective on that. Yes, okay, yes. from the from the definitely yes to the well, we're going to get close. The Ebola thing actually is a very good example because. You know, Maybe you should I don't elaborate think, a little bit what you, by what you what you mean by that. Uh, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong. We don't have the smoking gun with Ebola, uh, right? No, no, we don't there's, have good evidence. No, there's there's the best evidence says that it may have come from bats. Yeah. Okay, but that's about, about the the best you can say. A lot of conditionals so, in that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, so uh, yeah. And so, um, when, so we, when we talked to Tom Kaisak in Galveston, we asked him, will we find it? And he said, probably not. It's too hard to find a bat with infectious virus in it. That's, yeah. We don't have that. And he said, it probably is not going to happen. I think he said, we, we've got about as best as we're going to do. <laughs> but it, uh, it really emphasizes the need for this continued, not just trying to, <clears throat> not just trying to sort this out, but the sort of one health surveillance. Oh, and trying yeah. to understand what's out there, and yeah. uh, also the, the public health angle of it, of trying to uh, 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 understand when there is spillover potential. I'm actually, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, there's been, I think there are some conspiracy-minded people out there who will say that the uh, Chinese immediate closing and uh, run, um, washing down, sterilizing the Wuhan market was an attempt to conceal some uh, problem. Yeah. No, it was exactly the right thing to do. Yep. That's what yeah. you do when when you think there might be a problem. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad he said that. That was just great. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's... Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is... Uh, what was I going to say? I forgot. But anyway... Um, this is, uh, I'm glad to hear this is ongoing. So mm -hmm. we yeah. need to. Yeah, to and that done. was an important point to make it that that was phase one. And yeah. that all yeah. those things that they said, this should be followed up, this should be followed up. That there and and I appreciate it. I appreciate the comment that relative to the lab thing, if you have some real piece of data, let us know. Okay. Yeah. And we'll follow it up. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, let's wrap this up with some picks. Lighten things up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to revisit this uh, issue on Friday on TWIV. We're going to have Robert Gary on, who's written a, a lot about the origins of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Do you know Robert, uh, Kathy? No, I just I just recognize the name. Yeah, I, I've corresponded over the years, never met, I think. He was very excited to, to come and talk about, <laughs> about it. Um, anyway, Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked a documentary film that won the Oscar this year for Best Documentary Feature. It's entitled My Octopus Teacher. And uh, it's uh, about Craig Foster, who started filming in 2010. So this was 10 years in the making. He's a free diver, and he um, did this in an underwater kelp forest in uh, near Cape Town, South hmm. Africa. And he formed this relationship uh, over a period of a year with this female octopus. And it's amazing cinematography, storytelling, nature. Um, nature is a little bit of a horror story, but <laughs> overall, um, horror show, I guess is what you say. But uh, overall, I just, I highly recommend it. And then, you know, of course, I wrote to to Rich about it, and he said, "Oh yeah, we already saw it." <laughs> yeah, I watched it with the grandkids. It's a fa it's a fabulous film, yeah. just fabulous. It's great. Um, uh, I uh, just one little footnote, and he comments on this briefly in the film. Uh, he does all this free drive free diving without a wetsuit. Wow. Okay, and I just looked up the water temperature in Cape Town, and today it is sixty-three point nine degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Man, 
Uh, that's cold. Yeah. Okay, for a long, and he dove every day. Yeah. For years. Wow. Yeah. And got to see that. I haven't seen it. Sounds great. Yeah. It's a Netflix original, so you can stream Cool. It. Rich, what do you have for us? So this is another indirect McFadden feed <laughs> because uh, I got into a conversation with him the other day about uh, science fiction literature. And uh, he recommended to me two books, uh, classics that I had never read by John Wyndham. One is The Chrysalids and the other is The Day of the Triffids, <laughs> which I uh, then uh, just... Uh, read. I devoured them. Okay, it's not real. I it's not real high end literature. These are light reads, uh, but I really enjoyed them. So anybody out there who's interested in sci fi, and interested in sci fi classics, uh, and has not uh, read these, I recommend them. Oh, look at this! The Triff. I remember as a kid seeing the movie Day of the Triffids. Wow, it was so. Yeah, scary. I never saw the movie. Um, but this is the protagonist uh, has made his living working with triffids. He suspects they were bioengineered in the USSR. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. One of the interesting things uh, about both these books, okay, these are both sort of uh, uh, post-apocalyptic novels written by uh, 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 John Wyndham, lived through World War II, mm. and this is the 50s, and it's, uh, you know, on the tail end of the atomic bomb. Uh, and so both of these imagine... Uh, an apocalypse of yeah. one sort yeah. or another and what that would be like. And and actually, interestingly, both of them, uh, contained in each of them, are essentially snapshots of how society might reorganize itself uh, uh, mm. in, in a post-apocalyptic world and different models of how that might be done uh, in isolation for, with each other and how they might interact. So it's interesting in that regard. Nice. Uh, my, my pick is a little um, heavy. <laughs> it's a website. Um, it's called SARS-CoV-2 Phylogeny and Spatiotemporal Spread. And uh, w when you load it, it takes 10, 20 seconds uh, to get the data loaded. But it's basically a tracing of all the lineages of SARS-CoV-2 uh, put together by this group. And the paper is uh, is just out on which this is based in molecular biology and evolution. And uh, in this paper, they develop a new way to look at the evolution of, of SARS-CoV-2. And, you know, part of the problem is um, that SARS-CoV-2, the closest virus to it, RATG13, is still too far away to properly make a phylogenetic tree. And so it's not possible to know the most common ancestor, recent ancestor. So they develop a new method for doing that. And they have, and, and so the website is based on this method of categorizing all the lineages that have arisen. Um, and the interesting thing is that they, they feel that the, uh, the ancestor was circulating in October, November, 2019, for sure based on their analysis. And they look at these different lineages that were circulating in Wuhan early on that, that Rich brought up in our conversation. Uh, and they actually think that there's this report of a fragment of, of SARS-CoV-2 from Italy, I think, in, in December 2019. And they think it's real. They think this virus was circulating globally already in December, not just in Wuhan. So it's pretty cool. And this is a dashboard basically where they're going to keep tracking the movement of these uh, lineages. It's not easy to sort out, but um, there is a, a page of, uh, what is it called? Um, a temporal. There's a tab called temporal where you could see the, the, the different lineages of all the SARS-CoV-2 that they've classified and how they've come and gone globally in the past year and a half. And basically... Um, if you look at a world map, which they have on this as well, you know, the lineage in the North America has pretty much been the same since the very beginning. And whereas in Europe, it's been shifting around quite a bit more. So I think the cool part is that it's uh, probably been circulating <laughs> since October, November 2019. And there has to be a signature somewhere of that. And they have to yeah. just find it, you know, and it, I think it'll be found. So. Uh, you remind me of this uh, uh, RATG. Nine, uh, 13, 13 yeah. whatever. I, I can never remember. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, this is another example of um, 
the uh, public not really understanding what some of the data mean. <laughs> Because everybody says, 96% identical, you know? Yeah. No, no. it's 4% different. It's a lot. Okay, and yeah. that's a lot. Uh, yeah, and a 30,000 base genome, that's a lot. So if this is, RITG13 is not the ancestor. You know, if people right. think people were working on RITG13 in the lab, which they weren't, um, it couldn't have been the ancestor. Uh, it, it, it's more than the difference between apes and people, for yeah. example. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> significantly <laughs> more. Yeah. All right. That'll do it for TWIV 760. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. Send us your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. I was listening to a podcast and they said something which I thought was really good. They said, if you if you create something that people really like and they identify with, they'll support you because they feel good about supporting something. And I never thought of it that way. I always thought of expenses, you know? But when you when you see something you really like, you want to support it, right? I, I definitely feel that way. So if you really like what we do, microbe.tv slash contribute. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, this is a lot of fun. It's really uh, good to talk to those people. Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. And Vincent, thanks for doing this. It's a privilege to be here. Yeah, me, a privilege to do it with everyone. It's great. Yeah. I'm glad. And that's that's actually a good point. The three of them spent an hour with us because they yeah. recognized the value of uh, what we got here. And I think that's important. They Would they spend an hour talking to CNN? Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe CNN wouldn't want them for an hour because they don't know what to say for an hour. But I think it's important to have this venue, yeah. right? So yeah. we're very grateful sure. that they have the respect for TWIV uh, that they do. By the way, um, when I emailed them yesterday, the other day to send them the Zoom link, Peter Daszak said, uh, I said, we'll probably be an hour. He said, it doesn't matter. It's a slow news week. <laughs> 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 and then Marion said, agreed. And then Thea wrote, I'm looking forward to more T dash W I V. And I said, What does that mean? I said, Oh, Wuhan Institute of Virology, T dash W I V. <laughs> Very clever. Um, uh, did I say who I am? I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.